Thank you for coming to the food systems panel at the Spring 2011 Reskilling Expo here in Santa Cruz at the Live Oak Senior Center. Uh, my, my name is Tim Galarno, and I'll be the first presenter this afternoon. I work with the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems at UC Santa Cruz uh, and involved in many community and campus partnerships and effort, efforts around education and engagement. Uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you uh, a little context of you know how I come to understand some of the inherent challenges in this vague term known as a food system that we'll break down a little bit more together uh, and learn a little bit more about some of the Santa Cruz and regional um, responses, uh, actions, and developments for creating networks for changing our food system, for creating a more healthy and just system, as well as bringing it into the youth dimension. I think often we need the um, genius and, and dreams of youth with the reflections and visions of elders together. I think with a reskilling expo in mind, there's a lot of you know knowledge to be passed on and a lot of inspiration to be heard from young people. So hopefully I'll be able to touch a little bit on both in my presentation. Uh, so to start with, um, I'd like to start off with a few images to contextualize the challenges we're facing here with our global food system. And I think pictures do a lot to tell those stories. So uh, in the upper left, um, we have a, a you know massive irrigation pipeline. I think it's a great symbol for how we are inefficiently using water in our food system. And it's very telling for me. Um, not just on water issues in general, but looking at the role of food system and greater water security, given agriculture uses between 70 and 80 percent of fresh water globally. Domestically, it's closer to 80 percent of our fresh water is used in agricultural systems. So when we think about, you know, reducing our flow in our backyard gardens or flushing our toilet once or twice a day, it's just making a dent compared to some of the work that hasn't been engaged with yet in holding agriculture into greater accountability with water regulation and efficiency. I think there's a lot to be said there as a snapshot and an aspect of the food system. The upper right hand corner, what is that if they're not spraying water? Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, so they're spraying some form of pesticide or applicant, um, could be an herbicide as well. Uh, so um, when I was a student at UC Santa Cruz, I did a lot of um, research into Central Coast pesticide applications and looking at California agriculture in the conventional sense. And when I came to find out that over 195 million pounds of pesticides are put into California soil annually, and the um, Pesticide Action Network's lead researcher, Susan Kegley, noted that upwards of 80% of those are prone to drift, not into neighboring fields, but into backyards, nurseries, schools, daycare facilities, and to some of the most vulnerable populations to be exposed to pesticides. I began to raise questions around, you know, how does that, you know, work with communities themselves? How do communities begin to address, you know, buffers and safety measures and, and set up precautionary systems because agriculture is no longer out there? We see urban sprawl, suburban developments backing up and buttressing right against large-scale conventional agriculture in the state, and we need to start to better understand some of those challenges. The center and the bottom three are some of the images I like to use to model concentration. I think all too often we're really disconnected to the forms of power in our food system. As we see companies that own the rights to the fertilizers, the seeds, the distribution and packaging, they set contracts to growers and really inform them of the price they're going to receive. And really what that means is we're losing on the ends. We're losing where the consumer isn't being able to connect with the other end, the producers, and both are losing out in terms of the price they're paying and the amount they're getting paid for. Uh, and we're seeing more and more concentration in the middle of what we call the food chain or the food supply chain. Uh, and these are companies that have incredible power vertically, so owning the distribution, the packing, the seeds, the energy, uh, two horizontally where one company may buy all the same similar types of products uh, and just own the brands but never really indicate their connection but they control and dominate that one food supply area so these are like hidden areas in our food system as well as you know the bottom slide that vision of monoculture and I think one of the greatest weaknesses and the lack of resiliency in this agricultural system is when we begin to invest massive acreage into single production agriculture crops and we can face you know massive pest invasions which involve then massive applications of pesticides. Uh, and we don't really take into account the diversity of resiliency when you're laying out a, a different 
vision of a farming system. Uh, many of the principles in which we espouse in our ecological horticulture training program at the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, where students learn about diverse forms of agriculture, small and mid-scale, uh, and how to set up an efficient business plan in ecological farming landscape. As we move through it, the other distance it gets to us, and many folks are familiar with the average notes of between 1,500 to 2,400 miles is the average distance between what's on a plate you get as a consumer and where it's produced and mingled and distributed and packaged. Um, but that vision of infrastructure and distribution is another big piece because the public pays for our roads and highways. You know, the food system banks on, and the companies that do massive large-scale distribution and exporting bank on the public's payments of the infrastructure to provide the access through these highways and byways. Uh, and often the issue of food security is also addressed in terms of community access and empowerment. After September 11th, Homeland Security created a food security task force. A farmer, uh, an activist in the Southwest, I know Don Busto was on that. Uh, and the question was, how long would it take before food disappeared off the shelves as major highways were attacked from terrorist plots? Really what they come to find out is between 48 hours and six days, most grocery stores around the country would be barren. So when we invest in a large-scale, long-distance transport system, when we think about accessing food through our retail points, our, our grocery stores, as that's our security versus the farms are coming from and the policies to support farms in our regions, we're really losing kind of the, the vision of how do we integrate towards a resilient community that has access and abundance with its food. But we can't have any of that without the recognition of those that work in the fields. And I think this is a very personal and a very distant point of origin is, you know, those that are working. So in California, at peak season, we can have between 900 to 100,000 or 900,000 to a million farm workers in the state with close to 465,000 jobs. And with half of those farm workers not documented, the easy movement of exploitation and lack of access and support for that worker base is appalling. So the average income of a farm laborer hovers between 10 and 12,000 a year. You could imagine trying to live in California and paying rent and having a family with those type of earned incomes, not to mention any access to health care, social services, or support from a broader community, especially if they're not even speaking Spanish, if they're speaking any indig indigenous language coming from Mexico or Central America, they're further marginalized. Uh, and these communities are much smaller. Um, and I think, you know, to even draw it in a little bit closer to, you know, home in California and with my concern and passion of young people and their necessity for change in our food system and being a core driver for that, there's a young woman in this photo here, Maria Vasquez Jimenez, uh, who out of Merced was a table grape harvester. And, you know, her story, I don't know how many of you have heard of Maria Vasquez. Over a year ago, she was out on a really hot day and suffered heat exhaustion. There was no shade, no access to water. She passed out. The crew boss, because she was hired through a farm labor contractor, which is part of how we deal with all the labor in our farming and production in California, um, brought her up to her truck, tried to rub a little rubbing alcohol on her face to wake her up, put her in the back of the truck to finish the shift. At the end of the shift, they dropped her off at a clinic and her temperature was close to 108 degrees. She died two, two days later and uh, 17 years old, undocumented. And the uh, farm labor contractor was brought to court on manslaughter and the couple received 40 hours community service and a $370 fine for the death of a 17-year-old woman harvesting the fields. A, a judicial system and a regulatory system that provides that type of slap on the wrist for the death and exploitation of young people in this country and for those that harvest our food and toil day in and day out is unacceptable and is actually daily happening. So I mean, I think we need to make it real that this, this, this global food system is structurally broken, that there are several levers that need massive shaking for change and ultimately, we cannot disconnect the ecological components, the ideas of localism and regional food and abundance and diversity and different forms of horticulture and gardening from the reality of workers in the system of exploitation. We need to really sanctify and, and, and hold a course of social justice with our work for change in the food system. And we cannot forget the people. And bringing it to people and bringing it back into this country, I'd like to you know, highlight two contrasts. Um, one is a week's worth of food from an Ecuadorian family um, through a great book called Tales of a Hungry Planet. 
So this picture, again, tells of, you know, abundance. This family is really proud of the food they're producing. In fact, the kids are probably involved. In fact, they're exchanging food with their neighbors. I don't know how many of you grew up on a farm or where you source most of the, most of the food from your own backyard or your neighbor's backyard. Okay, so I see a few hands, which is exciting because I often highlight the next image, which is the model American diet. So according to the World Health Organization, this family is still lacking a lot of nutritional aid, and they're really not balanced in their diet because our food pyramid is far superior. In fact, we can teach a lot with the American food system. So uh, this tells a powerful story of where families are aiming in this, in this system, and it's, it's hard to kind of navigate and find ourselves in a system like this because it's so confusing. There's so many brands. I mean, and you have a proud family that's doing the best they can to feed their kids, and their kids might want a little box and, of cereal that has a prize. They might love their frozen pizzas when mom's busy and on the go. Uh, in fact, Coca-Cola, you know, a little sugar isn't bad, you know. The, this, but this is really more telling of the average American diet and family environment. And, you know, we're in Santa Cruz, so maybe it's a little bit different, and we're at a reskilling expo. But I think if we're going to look at changing practices in a large systemic way, we need to really own up to the system where we have and have inherited. And this is a system that aver averages, you know, over a million dollars an hour of junk food marketing to children in this country, 10 to 12 billion a year. Uh, so when we try to think about change efforts, we are battling enormous power, money, and forces that really want to continually develop a system that is controlled by less and less companies and that can get into the home more and more through marketing and advertisement in different forms so that brands are identified as part of the family and part of the family spirit. It's gone so far to see products like microwavable meat push popsicle pasta sticks. So, you know, and this is a powerful story here. You know, we've got you know, Johnny and his mom, she's a very professional woman. You know, we want to uplift women in our society to get the right jobs, but also to nourish their kids. So this is telling you, you know, it's okay. Be professional, and you can still feed your kid, and he'll be happy with that microwavable meat push popsicle stick because he's going to get all he needs of nourishment from that. Don't worry, mom. Keep a strong job out there and, and keep him well fed. And, you know, that type of marketing is part of, I think, the, the evil empire of, of junk food marketing in this country. And, and we are pumping students out in marketing to become creative and savvy and to do these things. I mean, we have this contradiction in this country where we want greater health. We have the, the Obamas pushing for a healthier food system, Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign. Um, even her, the predecessor, one, George Bush Jr., launched this campaign on obesity and pulled together the largest companies doing food um, production and food systems for kids in terms of products, cereals and, and junk food and whatnot, and they all wanted to get on board, and, and their collaboration was a collaboration around Shrek and Shrek characters, and I don't know if anyone um, had seen some articles on this, but it was really fascinating. So all the major food companies got on board, and DreamWorks created all this Shrek physical activity and healthy food advertising and campaigning. The U.S. government put that out and pumped out all these marketing for kids to try and do some healthy marketing. The same year, those same companies produced 30 junk food products, green-filled cream Twinkies, you know, Shrek sugared cereals. So they were able to, to dominate the collaboration for creating healthy food systems for kids and then also sell junk food with the same marketing. I mean, that's just, un again, unacceptable, and there's a lack of accountability when it gets that distance from communities. There's a lack of recourse and a, and a little bit of a lost sense of what do we do. And I think that's what brings us to this other image. Does anyone know what that image is to the, to the right there? It's a symbol of kairos. It's God's reckoning time. It's a Greek symbol of when past, present, and future come together. It also is a symbol of a unique opportunity in time. And I think we're at one of those moments right now where we recognize how broken our food system is. We recognize the impact it's having on our communities where children will be the first generation in America that will live less in age than their, their parents. I mean, th this is something where we need to come to terms with it immediately. We can't start arcing and planning a change that will take 100 years. We need significant change now. So what I hope to do is to highlight a little bit of how that change is happening, how within our community, uh, and how more broad scale we're trying to take advantage of this unique moment in time. But first, we need to get a better sense of really what 
a real food system could look like. And a model I want to share is a real food wheel uh, developed by students and how they kind of come into working on food issues. There's many different spokes to a wheel, you could say, many different sections. One is kind of on that consumer end where you've got your access, health, even pleasure issues. Students want to have really tasty food. They want to have access to the food they want. And there's some interest in health. There's a producer end, both home and abroad workers in that system. There's some people really agitated and engaged in those issues. Many are concerned with the earth, whether it's animals and animal production to natural resources, uh, to climate. And often, again, the big disconnect with climate change and agriculture, uh, just being that the global food system is one of the lead human contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. It's not just the style of agriculture, it's the emphasis on animal production, enteric fermentation from cows belching and farting and all that wonderful stuff. It's contributing a lot of hot air. Uh, and, you know, as we continue to buy our compact, compact fluorescent light bulbs and, and buy our Priuses, we, we, we can do those substantial small steps, but there's a lot that can be done with small steps in our diet and the way we look at our food system and how we relate to it in that end. And importantly, communities, and that's why I think we're all here, is, is really looking at control, education, culture, the economics in communities, where the really power is back in communities, because that large distance system can be so confusing. We need to have some ground to start, start with and stake out a claim that this is enough and this is what we can do. So what I wanted to highlight is a few stories of local inroads, levers, and actions for change uh, that I've been a part of in this region um, and that carry kind of some stories from the past few years here in Santa Cruz. So the first one is the Santa Cruz County Food Systems Network, which began in you know, or was reiterated in 2003, 2004 initially, and what it wanted to do is bring together producers, retailers, NGOs, health advocates, government, to start to think about what we could do for our local food system. Uh, a current kind of derivative of that in like the Santa Cruz City, more specifically, is Transition Santa Cruz with their food group. Um, but during the course of four years I was involved with our food systems network, we had some main focuses, local food policy, impacting planning, and building community. And so if you think about how I've got this dialed out on the screen, the yellow is the inroad, the network, the levers that we're looking to change is our policy, our planning, and our community building, and the actions we developed. So in Watsonville and Santa Cruz County, every September is local food month. Many of you may not know that, many of you do know. So often it's a, it's a month to engage in you know, promoting your farmer's markets, your local sourcing initiatives, to celebrate the harvest and as it starts to really bump up uh, and to bring people together around food. So during that time we held lots of events um, both in South County and in Santa Cruz to raise awareness around our agriculture, the diverse forms of alternative agriculture happening as well. Also looking at general planning, so each um, county as well as cities develop revisions to their general plan. And there's unique features to general plans, I think that we could really learn a lot from how to use these levers for changing our food system. There's points on you know, urban space, in open space, there's points on access, uh, so looking at you know, proximity of larger populations and their access to healthy, fresh food. The transportation grids, because it's not just about what your diet, it's about access to fitness, safe, open spaces for exercise. So looking at the designs of pathways that are either giant roads with no bike shoulders and your, your expectation that communities will somehow cross these pathways to parks, or looking at re-envisioning multimodal pathways so that access can take place. Um, two, looking at how to zone in our planning spaces so that some commercial space limits the amount of franchisees in certain restaurants and, and retailers so that we can provide more healthy access for communities. Uh, I think it's important to look at where they're located and where residential is located too. So I think there's a lot in planning that food activists, community planners can take into consideration during a revisioning process. And we participated both in the Watsonville and the Santa Cruz City, providing input and shaping some input for the revisions of those general plans. And I think that's an ongoing process that could be used in communities elsewhere across the country, and they are in fact. In fact, uh, next week in Portland, Oregon, over 600 organizers around the country are getting together for the Community Food Security Policy Conference called From Neighborhood to Nation. And a lot is talking about how to engage and regional community policy and empowerment for change.
Another aspect of that was uh, looking at community food forums. So we need ways for people to plug in. So we'd host larger food forums. We held one at Cabrillo Community College at the Live Oak Grange, bringing in just local residents and families to talk about their concerns and issues and for them to share issues they'd like to get more involved with. Because I think it's great to lay out a platform for change, but if you don't have the community's buy-in, if you don't have the community's passion or their interest there, you're going to lose the community. And this is really about fundamentally not just changing what's on the plate, but what's in people's hearts and minds. And we really need to stay on course with that. The second example is looking at the Santa Cruz County Health Committee in 2000, I want to say it was 2004 through 2005. Um, during the same developments of our food systems network, there was a concern around preserving organic farming because of the um, rapid exposure and drift of genetically modified organisms and seeds into organic farming operations and fields. Uh, and so rather than taking the issue of GMOs and genetically modified organisms into an agricultural subcommittee, there's a recognition that, you know, in fact, this could be a health issue because there's unintended health consequences. The facts and science are not satisfied yet on what contamination could actually do to a food supply and the impact if, if a certain um, element was transplanted into a, a product that then was consumed with someone that had an allergy to it, whether farm co rice, where they're testing aspirin and growing rice, and suddenly someone's allergic to aspirin and they eat in their rice, and it's aspirin in their rice, and they go to an anaphylactic shock. So there's extreme examples, uh, but more more, more or less, the, the idea with this health committee was to look at the precautionary principle. If the science isn't in, if the community isn't satisfied, why are we supporting its um, promotion and development in our region? And so what happened was really, I think, phenomenal. It's one of three county bans across the state that unfolded in the course of a year. Uh, and this was really successful. At the same time, larger companies like Monsanto and Syngenta were, were aiming at the state level. They thought they could preempt all of these bans by nullifying them with state policy. And fortunately, communities rallied and became very aware of that and focused on it so that these were grandfathered in to any preemptive state legislation and still hold their sway. So in Santa Cruz County, we still maintain a GMO ban thanks to the community looking at it as a health issue and taking action. How do we really know if you know we're not being exposed to GMO crops? And I guess that's something we're going to have to explore as well. Like, how do, how do we know when we set policy forth, how do we enforce it? And I think with something like a ban, there's official tracking and monitoring in terms of sales and dist distributions, both in the conventional and inorganic supply. If there is a contaminated point, your certifier might identify it in their recertification trial. And, you know, when you're sending in your samples, you know, that could be noted right there. You could also receive a nice letter from Monsanto that you're being sued for, for growing their crop unintentionally. So there's a, there's a nefarious way you could find out. And I guess the question is the recourse. And I think that's a very difficult thing in this, is we want to preserve our farmers and the health of our communities. And often it's in response that communities respond. But it doesn't ban what's sold, it's ban what's produced. So you can't produce seed or grow products that are genetically modified in Santa Cruz County or transport that product through in terms of the seed, not the food product itself. So the idea is, I guess, upstreaming in the sense that, you know, you're trying to move further up the stream to stop it and, you know, know, shift patterns and, you know, downstream, we have a whole mess in what you're consuming and what's at the retail outlets. Upstream, you know, you have an opportunity to source more from your regional markets. You have the opportunity to ask those questions. You have the opportunity to build intention. And then you also have protectionary measures like the GMO ban. So there's a question, is it true that it takes more water to grow GMO crops? And um, with every crop, it varies in terms of the amount of water it uses, whether it's GMO or not. So, and it also depends on the type of agriculture you're practicing. So with organic agriculture, you have a very um, intensely nutrient-rich soil that often has greater stabilizing and water retention properties than a conventional soil that's fumigated, pumped with pesticides, that is, you know, practiced a form of agriculture that isn't sustaining the soil, but is just creating the mechanisms to input into it to grow a product out of. So water flows through it, wind blows it out of the way. You don't have that rich topsoil base. So I think it's more of the form of agriculture you're practicing in the soil intention that gives greater water efficiency and resources and along those lines. So Monterey, San Benito, there's, there's no bans there. San Luis Obispo even so tried. Subject to cross-pollination. Yes. However, I mean, it, the, I, I mean, what I'm really getting out of this is it's a political statement. I mean, the fact that a community can come together and ban something, it's a big eye-opener for other communities. Like, wow, 
what, there must be something to that. That whole community like got together and, and we're able yes. to achieve that. Well, what's up with that? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a very good point. It is a very strong political statement. And in a time when people are becoming more and more dispower, disempowered, yeah. that's a really good point. <laughs> Uh, the next example up here, the Central Coast School Food Alliance, you know, we're really concerned about childhood nutrition, obesity, um, and you, how many of you have seen the Jamie Oliver show, the, his kind of chef revolution? So that's a sense where he goes around and looks at school food and kind of how crappy and acceptable it is, and his innovative ideas will bring about the change we want to see. But that idea of coming from the outside and telling the community what they're doing wrong doesn't really feel empowering. I mean, how empowering would it feel if someone would come and told you, you're doing it all wrong and you need to do this? It's, it, it doesn't work. So if we're coming from a community change model, we need the local Jamies, like Jamie Smith from Santa Cruz City School Foods versus Jamie Oliver telling himself what to do. And so our, what, what happened with such a show like that is then you have parents calling up saying, you're, you're destroying my children's health, you're producing all this bad food without even asking questions of, well, what are you trying to do? What are your limits? What are your challenges? So last February, we convened a, a meeting with Congressman Sam Farr, representatives of Bill Monning's office, um, regional stakeholders from Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito County, health offices, school board officials, food service directors, food service workers, families and parents, to talk about the state of our food. We brought in a renowned writer and author, Jan Poppendiek, um, from New England, who wrote a book called Free for All, looking at America's food system and school food in particular and its problems and opportunities for change. And it stimulated the development of an alliance. And this alliance really came together to look at how to support and bolster the dignity of food service directors, to create opportunities to share best practices for them, to support what's, what could become available on plates for kids with the problems of costs, resources, um, and challenges that are inherent in a school food system. And so currently, you know, with our levers, with the School Food Alliance, is really looking at building that network, sharing the models and programs, hosting kind of school food festivals. So our next school food festival will be October 8th at the Cabrillo Farmer's Market, a Saturday, which will be a really exciting opportunity. During that event, there'll be a stakeholder um, discussion sharing what's happening, some of the models going on, breakfast first programs and breakfast in the classroom, where um, food service directors are realizing it's not just lunch that helps students stay grounded, it's actually getting a breakfast. And many kids don't have breakfast before they come into school. Over 50,000 students in our regional Tri-County are food insecure, where they're not getting adequate nutrition. So our food banks are on board because they're realizing it's not just emergency food services that are going to help solve this, but if we could get balanced, healthy, culturally appropriate food for breakfast and lunch five days a week in schools, wow, that's going to do some change. It's not going to just get the right food in them. It's going to help these kids maybe be able to focus, be able to stay more balanced, be able to, when they exert, to you know, use that nutrition to transform their bodies in a healthy way. That you know, This is a powerful testament for standing up and doing something about it, coming together as a community. So we meet actually on a monthly basis um, over at New Brighton Middle School. Um, we organize kind of weekly with a core team of folks from our political representatives' offices, our school food directors, and uh, CASFIS is involved, as well as Second Harvest Food Bank. Uh, and there's a lot of exciting work happening, I think, with school food. And just for one last example, a, a larger health collaborative, Go for Health, um, run out of United Way, is an incre incredible interorganizational um, and government alliance that works on levers of health, of community health, access and control to address childhood obesity. And they've created a very powerful network. They've mapped and developed programs to you know, shift policy and engaging youth. I think one of the youth programs, Jovenesanos Youth program in Watsonville. I think I was really inspired with the past few years. They've been able to actually go and they have the kids walk out, middle schoolers, high schoolers, go check out their corner stores, see what's in them. Um, go look at their parks and talk with their families about if they feel, if their families feel safe for them going to play in parks or why not. And they documented this whole process and, and, and presented to the Watsonville City Council about why their parks might be not safe for youth to exercise in, why their corner stores don't provide healthy options and what they want to do about it. So it actually involved young people in shaping new policy, which I think if we're going to engage and talk about changing policy, we can't talk about that with 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds without including our teens and our youth because they need to see the inspiration and the ideas and they need to be part of it. And I think it's a really salient example. And kind of moving out in more youth, larger issues, we'll go back to some fun pictures here. I pretty much combined about 
10 slides in one and took out all the words. And what's happening here are young people across the country from corner stores to Capitol Hill at colleges and high schools are re-envisioning their school and community food systems. And to just speak to some of what's happening up in, in the right, I don't know how many of you have heard of Rethinkers out of New Orleans. So, you know, coming into 2006, you had this devastating community impact. I mean, that, that was a disaster of unproposed, untold proportions in terms of the stories aren't all covered yet, and it's still happening in its impacts. Um, middle schoolers from New Orleans were shipped out to other schools, and what they found coming back into their schools was that the other schools were a lot nicer. Um, they actually had toilet paper in the bathrooms, they had stalls on the bathroom doors, that they had lockers in the hallways, that there were, and they had murals, and it felt welcoming to go into these schools. And when they come back to a water-stained, flooded school, no stall doors in the bathrooms, you know, no lockers, where they're being forced to eat all their food with sporks, plastic sporks. How many of you have eaten with a spork? So these sporks, when they dig into their food, would snap and break. And so they'd flip the food all over their clothes. I mean, they were tired of it. And, and, I, and I had the opportunity to speak with these youth at a conference uh, many years ago in um, Oregon. Then I brought them to Bioneers to be on a youth panel and change middle schoolers that actually talked about the issues they're concerned about most and developed a 12-point plan, including they realized, you know, the, the shrimpers were devastated in Louisiana and Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina, but they were getting shrimp from China in their school meal program. They wanted to see, let's, let's support our local shrimpers. Let's look at, we can set up policy to get local food in our schools, healthier food, that we can develop community murals that would welcome us into our schools, that we would develop a more holistic understanding of what the school is and what dignity is and, and access and you know, safety for young people mean. And there'd be no more sporks. And so they, they presented this amazing plan to their school board, and the school board approved it. And what's happening is there are these rethinker middle school groups happening all around New Orleans and beyond where they're creating the same discussions and dialogues with community partners and artists and facilitators and the youth laying out these plans and, and, and making change. And in a bitter, bigger vision, you know, there's this urban justice and rural justice youth work happening that largely was happening in pockets disconnected. And it's the opportunity to create connection and communication that not only empowers a specific local community, but it empowers communities that are more broadly based and, and, and disconnected across the country. And so one high school outfit that does that is called Rooted in Community, or RIC. Rooted in Community connects, you know, tens of, probably 50 to 100 youth-based justice organizations across the country, where they bring them together for a national gathering to share what they're doing on their struggles and challenges of empowering themselves and getting a healthier food system in their communities. And so, I mean, I think that these type of networks are going to be necessary in the future, that the dialogue, not just within communities, but across communities will be necessary, and especially the dialogue from youth to youth, as we find that the bigger change happens when peers talk to peers, whether it's food service directors to food service directors, mayors to mayors, city council reps to city council reps. We need to look at that for young people and create those channels if they're going to be part of our change process. And in higher education, um, I worked a lot at UC Santa Cruz and on developing a different vision of our food system there when I was a student and we set our own policy goals to support local, organic, humane, um, have fair trade if it's far trade, to look at social justice in the food system. Uh, and you know, we did have some incredible success. We brought in a base of local organic growers. We set up direct relationships. We've purchased over a million dollars from local organic producers over the last five years, reinvesting in the local economy. Uh, and I saw that, you know, it, it wasn't just happening here. I was talking to students at other campuses across the state. And we realized that we might be able to do some more change. And so we shared our practices from campus to campus, from UC to camp Cal State campuses to community colleges. And we worked on a statewide campaign that, you know, passed in 2009 that set up the UC-wide Sustainable Food Policy, which is the largest institutional policy for sustainable food in the nation. And that set up goals on procurement to go from 2 to 20% sustainable food by 2020, or real food, 
to build an education because student employers, dining are the largest employers on campuses for students. There could be education, not just for the students, but for their staff around why they're making these changes. Bilingual trainings, you know, to really recognize the, the work staff going on on these campuses. To do energy conservation, water conservation measures. We found that just removing trays from UC Santa Cruz's dining saved a million gallons of water. And that's water that we had to heat and use in dishwashers. That's labor that wasn't necessary to have to wash and refill these dishwasher drains because the trays were too big and it was splattering water everywhere. It also reduced consumption and food waste by nearly 40% because people were taking more because they had a big tray. And what it allowed is uh, these simple changes. So again, the simple reskilling ideas, you know, it, it doesn't take a complex scientific technical, technological innovation to save money and resources. Simple ideas can make big change. And on the communication level, after it went statewide uh, through the California Student Sustainability Coalition, in 2006, we started talking to students across the country and realizing that you know, there are students working on animal rights issues, on local issues, on fair trade issues, but there was no platform to uplift all these pillars at once. And what would it look like to connect all these youth activist movements um, in higher education? And we found it's something known as the Real Food Challenge. That challenge is to shift from 2 to 20 percent because 2 percent of our food system in our larger U.S. food economy is considered sustainable or real. Uh, and we need that to change. And it's not changing fast enough. So this commitment is to shift all higher education dollars that go into the, our food system to 20 percent of those to real food. And that would effectively shift a billion dollars of food investment and divest that from a non-food economy to a conventional food economy to a real food economy with incredible ripple effects to production, distribution, and access. And currently, since we officially launched the campaign in 2008, we have over 372 college campuses, over 5,000 student leaders working on this challenge. And we're bringing in the high school students to take their real food challenge to their high schools as well. And we'll be growing fast every year. We're building more leaders in our base. We hold regional summits every February President's Day weekend at UC Santa Cruz is our strengthening the roots food, justice, and fair trade convergence. We bring about 350 students from 50 campuses there. Um, but the inspiration is growing nationally. And I think that, I mean, we need to work on those levels, regionally, county, statewide, nationally, if we're really going to solve community-based problems because it's larger policies and larger economies that are shifting our ability for change locally. I think food is such a, a larger cloud issue of defining that, you know, within the youth campaigns, we're trying to define what real food is because there's a way to define what it's not. So it's not filled with processed products that have high fructose corn syrup that are using antibiotics and growth hormones more often than they are used in any form of health services. I think like 70% of antibiotics produced are used in non-health related treatment and animal production systems. So I mean, we, start, we need to start divesting from this non-food system <laughs> Uh, and, 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 yeah, yeah, and what we saw is like student change processes have been really big from apartheid. The divestment campaigns in college campuses, including the UC divestment in South Africa during apartheid, and, I mean, Nelson Mandela noted that this was a key strategy and lever that helped them change their systems, was changing the dollars and where those dollars were going. And in the same vision with food, in our communities, in our policies, in our practices, in our networks, we need to vision how to divest from toxic agriculture and food systems that, not, aren't, that aren't feeding the planet, people, or communities, and to start defining what will. And I think young people are really helping to lead that. The one last note in this slide, the Live Real initiative, is, is launching at liverealnow.org. It's pulling together youth from historically excluded and vulnerable communities across this country to help teach and engage them and learn from them on skills to empower them to be leaders for change. Because it's in these communities, I think currently there's over a million Americans living in food deserts in California right now. It just came out through a study. Uh, and that's just in, in California alone. Uh, we, we should have young people from these communities standing up. So it's not just policymakers and educated lawyers talking about this, but we need communities to be able to articulate their own issues. And Live Real is about a platform that will allow young people to do that, for them to stand up and share their own commitments, their own values, to be amplifiers. We, we want to see them be loudmouths for policies, to stand up and speak their own hip-hop and spoken word for justice. 
And I think we're going to see a lot of exciting work coming out of that. Currently, there's a, a fellowship nationally that we're gathering young Live Real fellows uh, and building a powerful platform that mirrors Facebook. But like divestment in a non-food economy, our kids are spending too much time on Facebook. Sorry to the founders. I'm sure they can accept this. It's, it's true. You know, we're a little too much Facebook time doesn't allow much FaceTime. Uh, and this platform actually allows people to divest some of their Facebook time as young people to share events and resources and come together offline and gives them a platform online to do that. So rather than just a tool to connect online, this platform, uh, LiveRealNow.org, is designed to engage youth online to get them off their computers. And in fact, we're talking about a system that would sh automatically shut them out every like 20 minutes. So they'd have to get off their computer and go do something. Because <laughs> that's what we need. We want young people back out in our communities. They've disappeared. They've really disappeared in many respects. And we need them to be part of the reclaiming of our commons as well. So opportunities for all of you here. Um, this idea of kuleana, which is a Hawaiian term that roughly translates to responsibility or privilege, is to start thinking about our own kuleana in our communities. And in Live Real, young people are beginning to share their kuleana and their commitments for change. You know, there's opportunities to take courses, join classes or activities here in the region. Caspis offers many great community garden classes, beekeeping, herbal plant work, and, you know, different, you know, homeskilling, homesteading, reskilling programs that might be in alignment with those here today. Uh, there's work days on farms and community programs. There's opportunities to then take that action into your community and, and, and make you know a healthier community. And also collaborating and networking. If you're in a position where you want to get more involved, there's so many opportunities locally. From Transition Santa Cruz, our Central Coast School Food Alliance, Go for Health, our Nutrition and Fitness Collaborative of the Central Coast, and many more. Uh, and I think it's when we do this kind of action, when we step up, we also want to consider how we incorporate many levels of change. So we want to think about how our actions have ripple effects, how ripple effects are affecting our actions. So we're working on many levels, and we can't do it alone. We should access existing resources, templates, and models for community engagement so that we're not having to reinvent the wheel. Because I think there's a lot out there, and it's about making connections so we can learn more from each other. Kind of like what this event is doing for us today. My name is Liz Snyder, and I'm here to share yet sort of a third perspective on why radical change to our food system is very important, um, especially in our urban areas. Um, my background is uh, as a nutritional anthropologist. I have to sort of explain what that is, because not many people have heard of nutritional anthropology as a field. Um, basically, what I have spent most of my career studying is um, the intersection between our food choices and our cultural background. Um, so, you know, you all know what cultural anthropology is? Everybody's kind of heard of that, right? So the idea that um, our nutritional choices have everything to do with our cultural background and our emotional framework. To explain sort of my background, I think that what I want to start with is um, kind of talking about my field from a conventional perspective. So nutrition education is a field that um, spends millions of dollars per school district per year trying to help kids make healthy food choices. The bottom line is that the medicalized model of nutrition education says that there are good foods and there are bad foods, and that if you just eat good foods and don't eat bad foods, then you'll be healthy. Instead of treating food choices as a culturally mediated, very complex choice, it treats food choices as um, an idea that you know we can all think about food logically and medically, and then we'll be healthy. I just want to show you a little bit of the food marketing industry and the kind of things we're up against. And um, if you notice, all of these have health claims on the packaging. So Cocoa Krispies, supporting your immunity. And SpaghettiOs, plus calcium. And uh, a nutritious start to your, month, your morning, Capri Sun. All of these actually claim to um, improve the health of children. And this is something that has directly resulted from our model of nutrition education because now an entire generation of Americans has grown up believing that um, you have to think about food choices clinically. The food marketing industry is caught up with that. They say, okay, 
You think about food clinically, we're going to make clinical claims on the front of our packages and confuse the hell out of you. So, you know, without a, a strong background in nutrition, it's almost impossible to look at food choices in a grocery store and make a good decision. I mean, there's one place you can make a des good decision, that's the produce aisle, right? But <laughs> if you're in the... Even there, it gets complicated. It's getting more and more complicated. But everything that's packaged is um, reviewed and analyzed, and all those people with all their creative energy, it's all going into confusing the consumer. And parents are one of the single biggest targets. And then you look at the funding picture. And this is where my work becomes really, really frustrating. So can you even see the yellow line in the pie chart, right, the, the red? That is um, funding just for fast food marketing, just for fast food. This doesn't even count those packages in the grocery store. This is McDonald's, KFC, Taco Bell, all of that. That's the amount of money spent per year on fast food marketing, uh, $4.2 billion. Billion, not million. The little tiny yellow line, that is uh, the nutrition budget of the USDA the entire budget dedicated to helping kids eat more healthfully. That includes Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, by the way. Little quick calculation, it's every $1 spent for marketing fast food to Americans, there's a tenth of a penny that gets spent on marketing healthy food to children. People like to say that uh, kids just need to make better choices, but the reality is that there is an overwhelming disparity of messages encouraging children to eat unhealthy food. Here's the part where I get a little bit fired up, and it's, um, it's one of the things that I believe that the last 50 years of nutrition education has really done a disservice to our families, in that um, rather than trying to connect kids with the source of their food, in other words, you know, having urban agriculture as part of our education system, um, marketing is really ahead of the curve in how it gets people to make food choices. So marketing basically does all the things that traditional family food traditions used to do, but those family tr food traditions have been eroded by nutrition education efforts. So, you know, creating a band of allegiance, creating the idea that if you eat this food, if you eat spicy Cheetos, you fit in with your peer group. Um, you know, getting kids to feel left out if they don't have access to that food. Marketing literature, if you go to the original literature written by marketers for marketers, it actually tries to induce that feeling in children. There are studies that are completed on how do you induce that feeling in children of feeling left out if they don't eat your product. Um, another thing that's been extensively studied by the food marketing industry um, with scientific analysis on how to accomplish it is to induce nagging in children. They figured out about 60 years ago that the biggest way to get a parent to buy a product is to get the kids to nag for it. And so inducing nagging is actually a primary goal of the food industry. On the other hand, we hear a lot of talk about obesity as an epidemic. We talk about the idea that um, being fat shortens your lifespan. Um, at the same time, um, we have a diet industry almost equal in size and scope to the food industry that makes money on the other side of the equation. So uh, there's money in and money out. And <laughs> it's not working. I mean, almost probably everyone in this country has been on a diet at some point in their lives. And the, the science behind it actually shows it doesn't work. You know, it, it's... Um, the age where kids are starting to diet is getting younger. It's now down to age eight, used to be age 14. Um, and almost all dieters, two thirds, regain the weight within one year. About 98% regain within five years. So you've all heard of yo-yo dieting. It's probably in common parlance by now. Now it's starting at age eight. And so we're blaming obesity on kids' food choices, that they can't just learn to eat good food. But at the same time, we have a huge financial industry that is predicated on them not making those choices and to, to catch them on the way in and catch them on the way out and create a cycle. Here's something, just one little tidbit, a little factoid you can carry around with you. Um, that uh, Weight Watchers is actually owned by Nestle. <laughs> and that Jenny Craig is owned by the parent company that also owns Keebler. On the other hand, if you have kids that are free from this system of coercion, 
um, you'll find that uh, kids are naturally intuitive eaters. They make healthy choices. They eat when they're hungry and they stop when they're full. Uh, this is something we're all born with and we lose at an earlier and earlier and earlier age. Um, and it has to do as much with the way nutrition education is conducted that it does with the way that our food system is designed around getting people to eat too much and then pay to lose the excess weight. So, um, you know, the idea that kids get put on diets by their parents these days, Michelle Obama even talked publicly about putting her daughters on a diet. And uh, the idea that food restriction is the only way for kids to actually achieve a healthy weight, it, it actually undermines their ability that they naturally have to eat intuitively. Um, then we medicalize food choices and we remove family food traditions. And you just create a, a, an environment where that toxic sea of food marketing and packaged food can take over people's lives, much like in the picture of the average American food for a week. Um, there was an incident that uh, pretty much characterized this completely in talking about destroying family food traditions through medicalization. Um, I was in a hospital and I was um, in a community clinic setting where there was a young man who had just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, he was from a, a farm labor community. He didn't speak any English, so I was listening to his doctor talk to him through a translator. And the first thing that this physician said to him was, no more beans, no more rice. <laughs> Those were the first words out of his mouth. And I was absolutely floored to think that the, that the medical community would have the hubris exactly to undermine healthy family food traditions without first inquiring, what do you eat? You know, do you drink soda? There were no, no actual assumption of that, it, it must be this man's cultural heritage to have this disease. And therefore, his cultural foods are inherently wrong. Now, most physicians don't get a lot of training in nutrition, so I'm not that surprised. But at the same time, what basically the message seems to be out of mainstream medical culture is that it, you know, any food choice that is culturally mediated is wrong because it's not medically mandated. And so, you know, if you're not eating your lean cuisine, you are not actually taking charge of your own health. Now, um, my work has all been around the idea of we can reignite intuitive eating in families, not just in children, but in parents too. Um, but that first, we really have to take down that framework, to take apart the model of nutrition education in our schools that leaves kids pretty much unable to make healthy choices and to have a healthy emotional framework around food. It's a cycle. It's a cycle of dieting, failure, and shame. And it's reinforced in our schools, in our homes, and the people who benefit the most are the food, the food industry. What I did was a lot of research into what's the alternative. How could we do nutrition education in such a way that kids walked away with a positive emotional framework? How could they you know, be intuitive eaters and have access to healthy food, know how to cook it, know how to eat it, honor their family food traditions? You know, what, what thing, what could we bring to schools that would do all of those things? And I really only found one answer. It's a three-pronged approach. It's garden-based learning, culinary education, and family food traditions. And all of those require access to urban land, whether it's a one-acre school garden or an 11-acre working farm. Uh, it needs to be not a long bus right away, you know, not in some distant thing that you only see in a children's picture book, but really on every campus, in every community, there needs to be access to land in our urban areas in order for kids to really connect to healthy food. Um, much in the same way that food marketing companies try to create false emotional connections with all those products. I'm from Silicon Valley, and so I'm gonna talk to you about three projects that I've been involved in that um, sort of represent those three-pronged approach. And Full Circle Farm is in Sunnyvale, and um, this is a, a project I co-founded kind of in my own backyard. It's um, an 11-acre urban farm on a middle school campus. And um, it, I mean, if you imagine 11 acres, that's about eight football fields. So it is a large working farm. 
probably one of the last pieces of land in, that large left over in Silicon Valley. So um, it was almost miraculous that we were able to actually um, obtain a lease for the land. And um, there's a nonprofit that runs it. It was founded in 2007. And what it does is gives weekly access for 1,200 middle school kids to come out and not just see and experience like on a field trip a working farm, but to actually be a part of running a working farm. And the amazing part, if you go into the literature about garden-based learning, one thing you find is that even if the curriculum has nothing to do with nutrition whatsoever, they're out there learning math and science, they start eating better. You can track this. So just access to the process of having land and growing food automatically makes kids healthier eaters. Now you can add some curriculum on top of that that can boost it even more, but the bottom line is it's the access to land that makes all the difference. So um, at Full Circle Farm, we're also trying really hard to um, create a farm to school program for Santa Clara County. It's the first farm to school program in Santa Clara County. We're pretty behind the cur curve of Santa Cruz on that front. Um, but you know, there are a lot of challenges toward getting urban farms produce into a school that's right next door. It's taken three years and uh, right now all we're giving them is cherry tomatoes and seedless watermelon because that's all that their kitchens can support. Uh, so I could talk for a long time about the challenges of uh, farm to school, but um, it's been an interesting learning experience, but the real joy of being out there is the access that kids have to the land and to the experience of growing food. Full Circle Farm does culinary education, but uh, everything that we do, we got from an organization called Collective Roots in East Palo Alto. So we followed their curricular model, which is really comprehensive. Um, Collective Roots r works um, through the East Palo Alto Charter School. And uh, what they do is they have only one acre, but they make incredible use of it in that they have a really bio-intensive garden space. And then all that food is harvested and put into a salad bar right there in the school. And because it's a charter school, they're free from a lot of the restrictions that we are. The ability to grow, cook, and eat foods that matter to your culture, that uh, your families recognize and support, it makes all the difference in the world in terms of kids feeling like they are empowered. Um, I, I've seen groups full of kids that um, will say that they don't want to eat any vegetables. They'll even say, I'm allergic to vegetables. <laughs> and walk through that program, uh, plant a seed, watch it blossom into a beautiful broccoli plant, harvest that broccoli, cook it in a stir fry, eat it, and now they say, broccoli is my favorite food. It's my favorite food in the whole world. And it will literally very often be the first time an urban child has any access to that experience. Um, at, at Full Circle Farm, we work with middle schoolers. I one time led a, a garden group with 12 middle school students, sixth graders. They had their first harvest of their garden plot and pulled out radishes. And unfortunately, we'd let the radishes get way too big. Um, and I don't know if you guys know what radishes taste like when they get too big, but really spicy and woody, right? And I thought, oh my god, I'm going to ruin their lives because I'm trying to introduce them to the joys of growing food and their first harvest is going to be these disgusting radishes. And they pulled those radishes out of the ground and they all tried them and a few noses wrinkled and then they said, they're so good. These are great. And this group of 12 kids who, mind you, none of them had ever actually seen a radish before. They didn't know what a radish was before they pulled it out of the ground. Um, they all said, it's so great. I love it. I tried one. I mean, they were awful. These radishes were totally inedible and they ate every single one because there's a sense of pride there. And it really, it's not necessarily about growing food that tastes the best. It's about the experience of growing food and the pride that is associated with that and the sense of place. More recently, I've been involved with an organization called Vegilution in San Jose. Um, it's a currently two acre farm growing rapidly, probably to a total of 12 acres if all goes well someday. 
Um, I don't work for VeggieLution, but I was involved in their foundation. Um, and now I'm, I just recently took a position with First Five of California. They're funding the um, start of a community-supported agriculture program through their family resource centers. So these are low-income families with kids age zero to five, and the produce will come in part from VeggieLution. So locally grown food um, to low-income families in a weekly box program that hopefully if we can work it all out, we'll accept EBT cards as well. So um, the idea that you know you have to create this integrated approach full circle where um, you're not only reaching kids in schools, but you're reaching families in their homes and you're changing the food landscape of the community to create access to food because it, you know, it, there are places everywhere, you know, it's um, a million people in food deserts. East San Jose is definitely one of those. Um, so in that case, it's the idea that, um, you know, food doesn't have to be just nourishment. It has to be a honoring of people's culture and it has to be pleasurable and it has to uh, feed people's emotional frameworks. I already touched on this, but, you know, for me coming out of the health movement where everybody is talking about kids' health and bemoaning kids' weight and diabetes rates and all this stuff, um, what I always try to emphasize that there needs to be a new priority set for land access as a key point in, you know, helping kids be healthy because without the land, there's absolutely no way that it'll happen. Um, I, I'm also involved with starting a urban land trust, which is the idea of permanently preserving pieces of urban land. Traditional land trusts look at the, the hillsides. They're preserving, I say, the view shed, not the food shed, um, and uh, are really focused on number of acres preserved. What we're looking at is really small urban plots. Can those be permanently preserved as sort of, um, especially in Silicon Valley, those last agricultural families are deciding what to do with their land. So, um, you know, I really want to see a Silicon Valley where healthy food is tied directly to preserving open space. If you go to the uh, CSGN, California School Garden Network, you can actually look at the full text of most of those articles, or at least the abstract. Um, but um, I think the most famous one, um, I'm not gonna remember the name of the researcher, but it came out of Texas A&M University, and they had an elementary school-based garden education program that was um, STEM curriculum, science, technology, engineering, and math. And um, so they were hoping to improve math literacy in elementary school aged children by having a garden based program where they were doing a lot of measurements and graphing and doing all these, these science experiments. And um, one of the researchers almost casually decided to ask kids about their fruit and vegetable preferences uh, pre and post their garden education experience. And so what they found was a dramatic rise in preference for fresh fruits and vegetables after the experience of growing them. And so then um, subsequent studies have all um, looked at the same pre and post kind of testing, but they've gone a little bit deeper in terms of not just preferences, but like things like um, willingness to try new fruits and vegetables. You know, how, how averse are you? How likely are you to say, ooh, I don't want that before even tasting it? And in all cases, the, the aversion factor went down dramatically after a program like that. Um, and then the other thing is that um, the idea that kids also feel empowered to talk to their families about wanting those foods. So the nagging factor that marketers um, that marketers talk about, inducing nagging, nagging for packaged foods, um, gardens do that for fresh foods. So if kids garden in the classroom, they come home to mom and dad and say, why don't we have a garden? Why didn't we get broccoli for dinner? <laughs> you know, those things that, that food marketers have really capitalized upon for 50 years, garden-based education has the ability to do all those things for fresh foods. There hasn't been a study that just lets kids loose in a garden. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that that study has been done. I would love to see that happen just because um, my belief is that, you know, just the exposure to food growing in the ground is, you know, creates a sense of wonder in kids. I see it over and over again anecdotally where kids, you know, literally have never seen food growing before and never thought about it coming from soil. So just that revelation alone, um, 
I think makes a difference. I don't think it's been studied clinically. Um, and, and there's actually, I mean, there is a dearth of sort of clinical studies of garden-based education, but um, it's a field that's been around long enough that, that the anecdotal evidence is pretty high. Jamie Oliver's show is canceled, if you don't know. And there's many reasons for that. It's not happening this year. He thought he would get into LA Unified School District and trans transform LA Unified School District being the largest urban district in the state. And did they want it? No, and because we're, we need to look at emergent solutions in communities. The, the idea that you know all the answers, and that has to do with a lot of international development work also. Going into other countries and saying, well, you know, our models are excellent. Here we go. You should do X, Y, and Z. Build these dams. You know, get this nuclear power plant over here. You're going to rebuild your economy. It, 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 it's very, very troublesome. Uh, and, I, and I think that we begin to, we need to question what's the long-term forms of solutions. And those have to have the community's involvement from the get-go. Um, otherwise, you're going to lose interest. And in, on the previous question around is the issue of land and its influence, I think that goes across all outdoor education programs, um, not just garden-based. When you get young people out of a standard, sterile classroom and get them into life, they begin to live, <laughs> more or less. And I think it's a very important tool. And I've seen that in college students at UC Santa Cruz. We bring um, over 200 freshmen down to the farm in a program called Harvest for Health and Harvest for Hunger, where they harvest food for their dining halls to feed their peers, and they harvest food for the local food bank and gray bears. Uh, and, you know, they never knew carrots came out of the ground. And they just light up. And suddenly you see them as interns working on that farm. And it's not always a structured program. And I think that's a tension in higher education. They want a clear curriculum. They want clear educational goals. And quite often in the formation of CASPIS itself with the Allen Shadwick Garden, students just wanted to get out of the classroom and get back on the land and garden. And we are seeing young people go back into urban agriculture and just food production in very exciting ways and many of the young people though aren't coming from farms so I mean I think a lot more needs to be looked at on you know why is this this case in point just one other thing about the whole Jamie Oliver um, food revolution program um, having tried to initiate a farm to school program um, you know he had moderate success in West Virginia and then tried to tackle LA Unified and um, yeah there was a lot of hubris there because it, it's been four years trying to start a farm to school program in Santa Clara County, and um, it has been an act of community building. I mean, we need the will from the parents, the teachers, the administrators, the food service contractor. It can't just be, hey, you know, I say <laughs> that these kids should be eating this fresh food, and therefore you need to change everything about how you do business. It just, it can't move that quickly, and it has to be a matter of, um, I, I essentially view all food system work as community organizing. You know, whether you're coming from a background in nutrition or you're coming from a background in agriculture, it's about getting the community mobilized around the idea of making a positive change for themselves. I think, again, the idea that someone can implant the ideas also and then have the community engage their community in those ideas, it becomes very apparent where they're coming from. So this has been a huge insult for food service directors across the country that are breaking their backs to try and scrape healthy programs together with no resources, with as as Liz you know noted with her struggles over the hill you know the kitchens aren't equipped for fresh product anymore they're not equipped for cooking they're equipped for reheating in many instances there's no central there's no skill and dignity into the preparation of food and honoring those working in those systems to feed our children uh, and there's a lot of political tension around all of this and it's not an easy solution so when you have a salient tv show pushing the potential of change you inspire parents but unfortunately the inspiration is to harp down the throats and necks and telephone message systems of food service directors about why they're failing at their job and that's not what we need to do right now in our communities we need to you know uplift them and say you're doing really good work how can we support you further who do we need to contact in terms of administrators what type of funds do you need to make your vision happen or our vision happen together 
Uh, and that's what the Central Coast School Food Alliance is doing right now in Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito County. So um, I think that's a process that it's going to become more emergent and is more key for community change. So the question is, what's the larger status of farm to school? And, and, and it sounds like K through 12 based food movement activity nationwide. But you can look at farmtoschool.org. It's the National Farm to School Network um, hosted in part um, through the Community Food Security Coalition and West Coast um, in Southern California at Occidental College. Um, they've, they've been a host to a lot of amazing food justice programs. They also help co-coordinate the National Farm to School Network. Each state has some form of a task force with partners and regions working on this. I think there's um, over 4,700 or 6,700 farm to school programs and, and growing. Um, it's, it's a really strong network. Um, there's often an annual to biannual conference gathering stakeholders together. The most recent one um, was out in Detroit this last year with the Undersecretary Kathleen Merrigan coming to talk about the USDA's commitments on farm to school. So, I mean, we're at a point in this larger movement where the government has mobilized both, you know, from an executive level to the administrative bureaucratic level. Um, the, the biggest issue is a lot of this is unfunded management. Mandates, a lot of speculative, we want this to happen, but we're going to give you six cents more, you know, to make this change, and you figure it out. Uh, and we need a bigger investment, and that involves a lot of retooling. And if we could just get a smidgen of that marketing money from junk food companies, you know, if they really want to buy into Healthy Vision, just give it to the organizers and the groups working on healthy food. And <laughs> sure, like co-brand it, say you're sponsoring it. But like Michelle Simone and Appetite for Profit, like clearly laid out, these companies are instead creating their own internal standards and marketing junk food under healthy hubris. And that's got to stop. And we need to capture some of that money. There has to be some way we can capture that money or regulate it in tax, tax marketing. I'm not, not to be regressive here, but I mean, the, when they're, they're taking out our communities and our kids and we can't really combat that with our own resources, let's tax them. My perspective on the growth of, of farm to school and also school gardening um, comes only from a personal perspective. I, I don't actually have any numbers on how it's grown in the last five years, but we founded um, Full Circle Farm in Sunnyvale, which is not an incredibly progressive community, in 2006-2007. Uh, and when I went around and I first started talking to people about the idea, we did garner a lot of support, but we also garnered a lot of blank stares, you know, where people were like, I, I don't know why you would put a farm on a school campus. Like, why would you even think to do that? What about a soccer field? Uh, so, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of, you know, just an unawareness of, you know, why agriculture is important, why kids would be involved in agriculture. Um, now, 2011, never ever get a blank stare. It's just accepted. Oh yeah, school gardens. Oh yeah, farm to school. Uh, there really is um, a growing awareness of the value of having these programs. It's not like everybody is 100% pushing for it, but at least from my own perspective in Silicon Valley, there's just almost universal awareness that these programs exist and that they have value. The East Palo Alto Charter School um, contracts out their food service operations to a, a little company called Revolution Foods. Um, the price point is a whole lot higher, but it's all fresh, prepared on site in working kitchens um, with employees who are trained to do everything from receiving a box of produce to transform that into a healthy meal. And the garden has become an integral part of that food service operation. So that's at one school with a very small contract food service with a lot of flexibility, a private company, um, versus let's say Santa Clara Unified where, where Full Circle Farm is located. It's 14,000 kids spread across five cities and um, you know the good news is that they're not using Sodexo or another large-scale contract food service provider they're providing all the food internally um, which means they have their own employees and their own procurement process and all that stuff but when you look at um, what they're able to do in terms of their infrastructure it's almost zero because there are no more working kitchens they have one central warehouse food can be um, because of union contracts for cafeteria employees they can chop and serve but they cannot peel and chop and serve i mean the, the rules go down to that level of minutia of where people are actually restricted in how they can prepare food 
Um, and the, so, so the bureaucracy that's been built around this system, you know, and, and there has to be a bureaucracy. I, I can't say that there's no bureaucracy needed because it is feeding 14,000 kids, 46 of whom get this lunch for 46 percent of whom get the lunch for free and also get a breakfast. Um, and so it's an incredible volume of food. And then you have the federal government saying you have X number of cents per student that qualifies for this free lunch. No more. And 17 cents of it has to be used on milk. And X percent is available for government cheese. But, you know, I mean, really, it, it comes down to the, the pennies being literally accounted for by the federal government at the outset. So a certain amount is already set aside for food products. The other part is, you know, there's such incredible restriction in what can be done at the school by school level. So if it can't be assembled and prepared to be reheated at the school site, then it can't go onto that tray. So the idea of a salad is almost incomprehensible. And, and the bigger level, the administrative um, ad administration of our national school lunch and meal programs, I mean, is a big contestion. The amount of regulatory processes and paperwork and energy spent both from districts, food service directors, and the larger regulatory infrastructure, if you took that money and invested it into the food itself, you could have free breakfast and lunch for every student in every public school system in this country. If we took all the money that went into the administration of these programs and the hours and time spent, and you put that money into the school food itself, you'd actually have food for everyone. It wouldn't matter what's in your wallet or what's not in your wallet. You wouldn't even need to track it. But the system has become so bureaucratic, and that's been a large challenge. So in Jan Poppendieck's book, Free For All, looking at you know universal school meal programs, she raises some of these questions looking at the bigger picture. And then some of the great tensions Liz brought out, I think one which is an opportunity, putting our thinking caps on in the community, is how do we engage meaningfully the unions involved in food service work in schools? Often it's a conversation with the directors and the other administration. So a case in point, breakfast in the classroom programs are really big now. It's a way to bring breakfast into, in the classrooms, into schools, because you can't create a breakfast period. But during homeroom and check-in, you can extend that for 10 minutes, and you can serve breakfast in the classroom. So Paro Valley just recently had a lot of news as they had their red flyer wagons wheeling the breakfasts in the classrooms. At the same time, the teachers' union flipped out. They don't want that mess in their classroom. And suddenly you have this tension of this vision of wanting to get healthy food to the kids, and the teacher unions are opposed to it. And they're fighting it, and, and, and you know, to, to not make it that cut and dry, the complication is maybe the conversation didn't involve the teachers' unions to begin with. So their natural reaction when something happens in their classroom is to step back and say, oh, wait a minute, you know, this, these, these are some issues that aren't addressed. And then creates a little challenge. And same too in the cafeteria, when certain school districts that don't have unions, workforces, can have parent volunteers that help augment the costs of doing all this healthy, fresh food and encouraging that consumption. If you're in a unionized school district, you can't bring in parent volunteers, which, you know, the labor costs are too much to service the kind of bigger vision of a healthier school food system. And so maybe it involves a dialogue with those unions to say, you know, what could we do that would allow parents that are passionate, that want to come in and serve like a very minimal role in any service to the school that wouldn't be doing any peeling or prepping, but could help other ways that would free up time for the workforce to do more meaningful, skilled work as well. Uh, so, I mean, we can look at it in that fine minutia level, and then structurally, the whole system needs major revamping and work. And that involves a lot of political pressure, a lot of community pressure, and, you know, a bigger vision of how to undertake that, too. You know, teachers may actually look at this as a question of, of the loss in the family and the investment in feeding and, and their responsibility before they come to school. And, you know, teachers are already strapped, burdened, and spending out of their own pocket for services and, and, and really trying to committing to excellence in the classroom. Adding this additional dynamic is kind of, you know, questioning, does it belong there? And again, that may draw on the bigger questions of when we're, you know, single parent families and parents working multiple jobs trying to make ends meet and this kind of expectation of everything to enrich the families outside of the family. And I think, Liz, you could probably comment more on this. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, we're at a really difficult time where families are being ripped apart in so many ways. There's almost an expectation that the institutionalization 
of our, our systems are the ways in which we grow people versus the direct community and family dynamics to nurture them because we've, we really have saturated selves. We're, we're demanded to have so many roles today. You know, how can we serve them all? So what do you think? Just from a personal perspective, um, you know, I spent a few years as a single parent and um, I'm still a working parent. And, um, you know, it's incredibly challenging. It's incredibly challenging. Our society doesn't really leave breathing room for parents to do the kind of nurturing that they want to do. And then you compound it with, um, you know, say at Santa Clara Unified, 46% of kids come from food insecure households. That's defined as poverty level wages, most parents working multiple jobs to make ends meet, and there's not enough food in the house up to five times per year. So kids go hungry multiple times throughout the school year. That's almost half of the school district's population. And at any point in time, you know, m many kids are coming to school hungry, not because their parents didn't bother to feed them, but because there's not enough money to buy groceries that week. The unfortunate reality for a lot of school districts is that there's not enough staff to meet the liability requirements to open a cafeteria, because there has to be a ratio of adults to children in order to run a, a large space like that, like a cafeteria. So um, charter schools sometimes get around that. East Palo Alto Charter School has a really big breakfast program. Um, the the poverty rate there is much higher than Santa Clara Unified. It's upwards of 70%. Um, so many, many kids come there for breakfast and they do open the cafeteria. Um, but that is operating without a lot of the burdens of a conventional school district. Um, I mean, I, I know at Santa Clara Unified, there's a lot of teachers that, that embrace the breakfast feeding program, especially at the middle school level where there is a homeroom period that literally is acclimation to the school day, so breakfast can be a natural part of that. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, when you're facing a very harsh reality of kids literally coming to school, not because they forgot to eat breakfast, because there is no breakfast, um, it really... Um, brings home the need for there to be a support network there at the school. Um, you know, the other thing that really comes to mind, too, is um, liability concerns. Um, we live in such a litigious society, and school districts have really bore the brunt of a lot of that. My kid gets hurt, I'm going to sue you. You know, and uh, my kid has an allergic reaction, I'm going to sue you. And so, um, the, the, you know, administrators at, at large school districts are incredibly skittish, which makes them very averse to change. So anytime you come in and you talk to a school administrator, and I'm not disparaging anyone that I've worked with because they've all been wonderful people who want the best for these kids, but anytime you propose anything that's a change, especially if it's a radical change, they say, we can't do that. Someone's going to sue us. You know, we cannot be held liable for that kind of radical change in this school system. So the, the boat turns very, very slowly because everything has to be analyzed and, and made safe for the, not just the majority of kids, but 100% of kids. So at the East Palo Alto Charter School, kids learn knife skills. They use hot stoves. It really is a matter of us needing to work within those restrictions and understanding that, you know, unlike a Jamie Oliver, most of us can't use our celebrity status to come in and demand a change, that, you know, you've got to work within the boundaries of what there is and what's what's able to change and just keep in in a way that brings people into the discussion to keep pushing for that change.